So let's go to this. Basic stuff that innocent people that are, this is now what they study on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. How were the pyramids built? If you go a little bit lower, this is an article when you go visit uh, Egypt and you're touring, this is what they tell you. So here's how the pyramids were built. Go a little lower, Rob. Uh, they have different methods. So theories about how it was built. Go lower, go lower, Rob. So first one is called the ramp theory, then the water shaft, right? When you look at the water elevators, I got pictures if you go lower, Rob, and I want to ask uh, Graham because this is his world. These are all suggestions. These are these are all These theories. are all suggestions and Nobody theories. Nobody knows how it was built. Right. If, if you go a little bit lower, if you go a little bit lower, go lower, and then you have the, this is one way where mm -hmm. they were bringing it up, mm -hmm. okay, which, okay, keep going. Keep going. So when you when you look like that's another way. I mean, similar to the other one, yeah, the block placements uh, of the pyramid. A spiral ramp effectively right. that winds around the pyramid. What, do, what is your theory of how it was built? My, my, my theory is that ramps don't do it. Uh, if you have a straight a straight ramp, which is leading up to the Great Pyramid, if, if it's going to carry blocks right up to the what will be the top of the Great Pyramid, you're looking, nobody, no gang of workers can haul a 20-ton block up a slope that's steeper than 10 degrees. So you're looking at a ramp which is going to extend roughly a mile out into the desert. Uh, furthermore, that ramp is going to have to bear the load of very heavy megaliths uh, to be carried up. Therefore, the ramp itself has got to be extremely strong uh, in order to carry that load. Uh, and the problem is, where's the ramp? Where, where's the remains? There's nothing there on the Giza Plateau to, to suggest that. And so that's why this idea of spiral ramps has been proposed. Various other suggestions have been made. But the truth is, as everybody will admit is that these are all theories and that nobody knows how the Great Pyramid was done. I get it. There, there is no doubt that large numbers of strong men can haul very large blocks of stone on the level. They can if, if, if they're on a horizontal surface. There are even high, uh, images from ancient Egypt uh, with hieroglyphs which show a kind of sled-like device with a very large statue on it. We might guess its weight at 50 tons uh, being hauled along by teams of workers. And on the front of the sledge, an individual is standing there pouring water in front of the runners of the sled to, to make the sand slippery underneath it. And that would work. That would absolutely work uh, horizontally. But the problem then becomes how you get those gigantic blocks much higher up in the pyramid. And I don't think the ramp theory works at all. And, and uh, you have, um, for example, in the king's so-called king's chamber, uh, it, is, it is roofed by a series of granite blocks. And those granite blocks don't come from Giza, by the way. They were brought from 500 kilometers to the south. It's roofed by a, a series of granite blocks. Um, and those... And those um, granite blocks weigh about 70 tons each. And then there are other chambers above the king's chamber, which most people don't get into. I've been into. I've been into them. There's five chambers. They're called the relieving chambers. And each one of them is also floored by 70, floored and roofed by 70 ton granite blocks. And to get that massive collection of 70 ton blocks uh, about 300 feet into the air to put them where they are now is not going to be done with wet sand. And it's not going to be done with sledges. Uh, and to do it with ramps, I think, is extremely unlikely. Re relieving chambers? Yeah. That, that you said there's five of them? Yeah, one, two, three. Four. The top one is one, two, three, four. There's five. Um, and and the, the, the first one there, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, there's five chambers there. I've been in all of them. The one at the very top under that gabled roof, uh, that is one of the reasons why... Am I close enough to the microphone? I'm not sure. No, we hear you. That's, that's one of the reasons why um, Egyptologists feel confident in saying that it was the work of Khufu. Because in that top chamber, there is uh, what is known as a royal cut cartouche. Each um, pharaoh, the name of each pharaoh was surrounded by a kind of oval device called a cartouche. And in that cartouche is roughly written the name Khufu. Um, and and uh, this is considered to be a quarry mark that was put on the block at the time the block was quarried uh, and, was, and was never uh, cleared away. Um, you're looking at a cartouche on the left there, but that's not from that's not from Khufu's. Uh, well, that is actually Khufu's cartouche, I think. But but what you want to see is the one in the in the relieving chamber, um, because that is the single that is the single piece of writing that Egyptologists rely on to attribute the whole of the Great Pyramid to Khufu. Uh, there's a whole other argument. How was that first discovered in the modern era? It was discovered by a British explorer called Howard Weiss. 
and how advice in the mid 1800s was a, a vandal of the worst co- kind. He he blew a a massive uh, vertical hole in the southern side of the Great Pyramid. It just just scarred it, tore it to pieces with dynamite, and he dynamited his way into those relieving chambers as well. Now, how advice was suffering from real serious financial difficulties. He'd not made a significant discovery. He was ten thousand pounds in debt, which was a really bad thing to be in the eighteen hundreds, uh, and he had to come up with an amazing discovery. So there have been suggestions which Egyptologists do not accept. There have been suggestions that how advice actually forged that cartouche, cartouche, and he put it there uh, in order to uh, Just to come out and say, "Here's what I found. Here's what hey, I found. Hey, this is why it's worth funding my next project." Exactly, and it made his career. How much fraud? is there in archaeologists where they have to make up something for them to get credibility in their writing so they can sell more and get another raise or ask for more money when they're giving lectures and all this other stuff? How much, You know how they say there's 70% of art is fraud? Mm. How much fraud is there in archaeologists? Um, I would like to say not too much. Uh, I would like to say that. Uh, there is, of course, some fraud in archaeology. Human beings are human beings, and, and, uh, and it can happen. But archaeology is a profession that pr- polices itself pretty well. Uh, and and um, if a fraudulent claim is made, it is going to be exposed uh, pr- pretty soon. And I think, I, I think particularly around world-famous monuments like the, the Giza monuments, I would be very surprised to see, to see much example of fraud. Uh, uh, of course, any, any... I just pulled up an article. Check this out. Yeah, there it is. Crazy. Yeah, that's it. That's the that's the cartouche in the in the relieving chamber, uh, and that is the sole piece of written evidence which Egyptologists rely on to attribute the the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, to Khufu. Um, there isn't. There are. This is one of the ways in which the Giza pyramids are different from later pyramids. Giza pyramids are all attributed to the fourth dynasty. Go to the next dynasty, the fifth dynasty, and you're going to find pyramids like. Classic example is the Pyramid of Unas at Saqqara. That's U-N-A-S. The interior of the Pyramid of Unas is completely covered in hieroglyphic inscriptions naming the Pharaoh Unas. There's a massive amount of inscriptions. But the exterior of the Pyramid of Unas, as you can see there, is a mess. Now, you would have thought if the Great Pyramid was built 50 or 100 years before this that they'd carry on improving. You wouldn't have thought they'd devolve, build something like the Great Pyramid, and then 50 years later build, or 100 years later build this mess. So what happened? Well, it seems like the ability to build pyramids was extru- was was confined to a very specific period. And when they'd stopped it, I they, they saying. carried on building pyramids, but they weren't building them to the same standard, but they were doing something different. They were placing inscriptions yeah. inside them in detail, which do not exist in any of the Old Kingdom pyramids. This is kind of like we were better at landing on the moon 60 years ago than today. Uh, kind of like that. Yeah, but, makes but, sense. But it's interesting because you normally do see a continual <laughs> evolution, but in this case, you definitely see a devolution. Which, in a sense, it does make sense. When yeah. I say make sense, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so let me ask you this. Let's say Graham Hancock is given a unlimited budget uh, to, and you're hired as the lead guy to go, I just looked up right now, only 10%, less than 10% of uh, findings we've explored of the pyramid. That's mm-hmm. what I just saw. Mm-hmm. If you were given an a unlimited budget, open checkbook, a team that you get to put together, mm-hmm and ample time to go investigate everything you can about the pyramid, what would you do? Well, the first and most important thing would be, would be ensure that whatever investigation took place did not damage or destroy anything of great importance. This is something that's not often realized about excavations. When you excavate a site, you effectively destroy that site. So it had to be a very careful project with people who were very committed and, and, and in fact loving towards the Great Pyramid to undertake that project. But were it to be possible, were such a team to be assembled who we could be sure would not cause unnecessary massive damage inside the Great Pyramid, then my first priority would be to investigate what is in those voids that are all being found around the great within the Great Pyramid. Is there is are there other chambers in there? And if so, which have never been accessed ever by anybody since the pyramid was completed, I would like to know what's in them. That would be that would be my goal. And I hope Perhaps we will see that happen it's in the next anything, 20 years. Do you think there's anything revolutionary there? It's just kind of like we're just learning more about history. Uh, well, I suspect there might be because it's clear, clearly great lengths were gone to to make these places very hard to access. Just like the shaft of the Queen's Chamber that I told you about, which mm. goes, it's, it's like an invitation. It's 
please investigate me, please explore yeah. me, please find out about me. But we are going to set you a series of hurdles that's going to make it very difficult to do that. You've got to earn the right to investigate me. And now that we have this scanning technology, we're getting to the point, uh, at, at, at least in terms of our science, where we've earned the right, where we have the ability to ask the pyramid questions and to get answers from it. You're going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this, but the last 13 and a half years, I've been working on my first fiction book to write ever fiction book to write. And while I finished this book a year ago, I got the strangest phone call about one of the characters in a book where the guy wanted to meet with me and he read the book. And afterwards is like, wait a minute, am I the villain in the book? This is a story about a character named Asher, who is half Armenian, half Assyrian, whose father was involved in the Iranian revolution linked to Savak working with the Shah that they escape and he gets recruited to a secret society. Well, when you go to the secret society, it's been around for a couple thousand years. They've developed some of the craziest leaders of all time and they test you. There's unique tests that they have at the society where they test to see your emotional mental toughness. One of the tests that they have is very rigorous. It's purely mental. Of course, there's a physical one, but one is mental and emotional. If you're Armenian, if you're Syrian, if you're Persian, this is a book uh, you're going to be reading and saying, holy moly, this is the kind of stuff you talk about in here? Yes. If you're somebody that's fascinated by history, this is a book for you. Characters. There's a technology that this society, secret society, builds where you go into a vault. I won't spoil it for you. When you go down, they have a technology where you get to sit down and watch and have a three, four hour conversation with Tupac. You can set up a debate between Karl Marx and Ayn Rand, Karl Marx is in the book, who wrote Communist Manifesto. Ayn Rand, who wrote Atlas Shrugged, is in the book. Marilyn Monroe explains the concept of seduction and sex in the book. When you read the book, it's about development of the next leaders in the world and how they do it and how they've been doing it for many years. And it's also about how to prevent the end of civilization and how this organization goes about doing it. So, I've never written a parenting book before, but if I ever wrote a parenting book, this is the closest thing to it because it's all mindset, a lot of crazy stories. Again, 13 and a half years. Trust me, I told myself, I will not publish this book until I sell my insurance company and I'm fully disconnected from it, where it's no longer my responsibility 100%. When you read this, if you're a, cre if you're a creative person, if you like fiction books, if you enjoyed Atlas Shrugged, or if you enjoy Divergent, if you like books like that, I think you can enjoy reading this book. It's the creative side. Business books is very easy. Here's how you do it. Here's how, this is how it works. This is very creative. If you haven't placed the order yet, now you can order it on Simon & Schuster, Amazon. I'm going to put the link up below somewhere here, maybe even in my uh, profile. Go order the book and read it. I sincerely I've never written a book where I can't wait to read your reviews to, to see what you think about this book. So I'm going on this wild journey and we have some plans with this book here. Uh, if you support the things that I work on, I would appreciate you going to reading the book, order the book on Amazon and then post a review. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.